first Christmas card of the year, I think. That I hope is a check. It's a wedding invitation. A number of you have been asking me about what my saxophone setups are and everything. Now it is in the description below, but given the volume of questions I've been having, clearly we're not all reading the uh, descriptions, but actually I thought it'd be quite nice. It, it feels a little bit like show and tell, um, but uh, here goes anyway. And in a way it's quite a nice story because it's five years now since I've owned this Mark VI. So this Mark VI is a 1964, no, it's not. Hang on. It's a 1956 Selma Mark VI, uh, 67 da da da. Um, not telling the full serial number in case, you know, well, lots of reasons. Um, apparently, this used to be silver and all the silver platings come off it over the years. There's kind of lots of imperfections about this saxophone, but that's what makes it what it is. It has the sound that I want at the moment. It's kind of got it there. Before I owned this one, I had a 1937 Selma Balanced Action, which was a gorgeous saxophone, and it's a saxophone I wish I'd never sold. In fact, I remember reading something about Balanced Actions and people saying, the people who part with these always end up regretting it. And I do, I wish I kept it, I wish I kept it and bought this one as well because, well, I bought this one just after we moved back to England from living in, in Ireland. And the main reason for that was a lot of the gigs I did in Ireland, on the island of Ireland, both Northern Ireland and the Republic, a lot of them were kind of pop soul gigs and then some jazz as well. And I was constantly needing, I needed a brighter horn than what I had with my balanced action. So I actually bought, well, I ended up working with a company called Max Sax out of Austin, Texas. They were Taiwanese saxophones, but that's where they were based. Fantastic saxophones, almost exact copies of a Mark VI. And the thing I loved about my Max Sax, and I've got a number of students who still own Max Sax saxophones, uh, these Magnum saxophones, was that it, yeah, it looked like a Mark VI. It sounded pretty close to a Mark VI. It was a lot cheaper than a Mark VI. And so therefore, I didn't feel the need to treat it with kid gloves as I often do with my Mark VI. So when I played with this soul band, I played with an island called the Booze Brothers. Um, we had some, basically most of the gigs were weddings or, or functions and we played from 10 till midnight. So the great thing about that was I got down to an absolute art or science even, what time I could arrive at the gig, normally about eight minutes to ten, stick a reed on the saxophone, blow into the stage monitor. The thing is that everything has stayed the same from the previous gig, and at one minute to ten, I was ready to start with My Girl was our usual one, My Girl in C concert, followed by I Love You Baby. It's five years since, well, yeah, five years since I played with this band and I still remember the set list. The gig normally finished at midnight with Everybody Needs Somebody by the Blues Brothers. By the end of the DJ song, so the song that came after the band had finished, so like five past midnight, I'd usually got my saxophone away in the car, I'd been paid and I was out of that car park on the way home. Which after my daughter was born, was a really good idea because if you've got a newborn baby, they don't sleep too well and so you wanna get home, get to bed, get to sleep before they wake up again at three, four o'clock in the morning. Before the balanced action, I had a Yamaha 62 and that was another great saxophone. I bought that when I was 16, just before I started playing professional gigs, started getting paid for my gigs I was doing. And I estimated once that I must have done about 800 gigs on that saxophone. And the beauty of that Yamaha saxophone was it had this many services. A big fat zero. I never took it to a shop. It just never needed repairing. And these were gigs before the smoking ban came in, while I was drinking quite a lot on some gigs and traveling all over the shop and it getting bashed around in different tour vans. It never had needed a service. Everything was just great. It was a bulletproof saxophone and it was a great sounding saxophone and it just never let me down. And I, I really appreciated that instrument. It was a great one. I mean, I think if I'd had something like this when I was 16, whilst I'd be quids in now, um, I don't think I would have fully appreciated it and I don't think I would have treated it with its full respect, nor 
would I be able to cope with its imperfections and everything else like that, which is the uh, Yamaha was like that. Before the Yamaha, I had my first saxophone, which was an Amati made in Czechoslovakia. In fact, I used to love the fact that after the Soviet, after the Czechoslovakia broke up and so everything, I still had that stamped on my saxophone years later. Uh, that was one of those marks of something that was very old. Um, it wasn't a bad instrument. In fact, I remember when I was working with Max Sax, I worked out that that Amati in the today's money, as it were, would have been roughly about a thousand pounds. It was a lot of money. I think it was about five hundred pounds way back in 1991, 1990, actually. I think, yeah. So anyway, so that's the story of my tenor saxophones. I'm, I'm oh, well, I was just telling everyone about my saxophones. Where's your saxophone? I don't, have, I don't know Where's, where it is. Where is it? I have got to go make dinner in a minute, but let me tell you secondly about my sopranos. So with my soprano currently in the moment, it's a, uh, it's a Yanagasawa 992 bronze. I picked this out of 25 Yanagasawa Sopranos uh, when I first signed my endorsement deal with them. I was playing Yanagasawa saxophones, soprano saxophones, before I signed the endorsement, which is how it happened. Um, this is oh, it's just the best soprano on the market. I'm sorry there are no other better soprano. You might get a Mark VI, which kind of does different tones. You might have a Yamaha, which has slightly better... Uh, a slightly darker tone, but I'm pretty. If you work hard on this Yanagasawa, I'm pretty sure you can get almost any sound you want out of it, and that's what I love about it. The intonation is just flawless on it, which is what you want on a soprano. And it, to me, it just gives me that sound I want. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful saxophone. Before I had this one, I had the 991, I think. I can't remember, I'd have to look up for you. Before that, I had an Elkart, which was a bit of a crap one. It wasn't too bad, it was a black and gold one. Before that I had a crap one, I had an Odyssey. And then before that I had another, the, the other Yanagasawas, which is when I was at college, and one of the first things I did when I started, this is at Sixth Form College, when I was 16, the first thing I went and did is got my hands on their soprano sax, because I really wanted to play soprano. Primarily because of Bramford Marsalis, uh, all the stuff with Sting, and obviously his own stuff, and Coltrane. And so I was in the sax quartet and I got the soprano, so that was mine for two years. And when I left I wanted to get my own soprano, so which is why I got that Odyssey and I shouldn't have done so the moral of the story is don't buy cheap I also have a curved soprano which I've shown you before which is the well basically just the curved version of this why do I have the curved version well partly uh, being a, a fanboy get Jan Garbrecht was playing one and I was just like oh gosh that just sounds so cool the sound isn't much different there is a slightly different sound and it's you internalize it differently when you've got a curved soprano but primarily it's because it's so much easier to play around the neck and I don't tend to play it on jazz gigs because I just think it looks a bit daft, it looks like a toy in my hands, I'm such a big guy. But on uh, gigs when I've played with choirs, so that's my soprano story very quickly before I head up and make the kids tea. Altos. Now, I had, didn't own an alto until I was 20. I just did never, never played it. I started saxophone on the tenor. So when people come to me and say, oh no, which saxophone should I start on? You start on whichever works for you. Whichever one is the one that you think sounds like a saxophone. So this is a Yanagasawa A991B with an Eisen mouthpiece uh, on an eight star. It's a copy of a New York Link. And yeah, it's... It's just flexible, it's just like the Soprano. What I love about this alto, I spend most of my time on alto teaching and doing some classical stuff and then a bit of session work. And in the session work you need to be able to pull out a Sanborn-esque sound or you need to be able to play like Charlie Parker and this saxophone just gives me the facility to do that. I love a WO Yanagasawa, they were brilliant when I play tested them. You can watch up here. But yeah, I just this is just a nice, good, solid instrument. A bit like my t Yamaha tenor I had years ago. This thing has has had a drop. You can see kind of the nose is slightly bent. Uh, well, sorry, it's like a bent nose on the neck. Um, but it's just not let me down. It's great. It's solid. It plays well, and everything else that I need it to do. So. 
So yeah, so that's the story of my instruments. I've probably missed some bits out. Mouthpieces is probably could take five or six separate vlogs. I've gone through that many and still have that many now, uh, but we'll save that for a rainy day. Um, so there you go. Any questions or comments, stick them below and um, tell me what your setups are. What's everybody else playing at the moment? Because I'm sure people watching this vlog, if you're a saxophone player, have many different saxophone setups. So tomorrow I'm filming the Cambridge saxophone Christmas advert, which is kind of too late in the day, I have to get it done tomorrow, edit and get it out to you lot probably by Sunday. But you can get one of these if you want with a Christmas saxophone lesson or about any time a lesson voucher there. Uh, but this one is a special prop for tomorrow. Um, you'll see when the advert comes out. I'll do a behind the scenes if I get a chance tomorrow. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. It's exciting. It's one of these crazy brain waves that I have from time to time. We'll see how it turns out and we'll see what the video, um, hopefully it will uh, all work out okay. And you will see it over the next few weeks. <laughs>